you for inviting me to your to your group. So uh, so much of a pleasure to come together in the present moment. And it's a very dedicated purpose to come to this state of mind and this presence. And, uh, been traveling around the country just sharing this uh, peaceful presence and also a very openness so that um, in discussion groups questions can arise and to taking a look if there's any kind of blocks or interferences to that presence of living in the now. So uh, that's really what this is for me. It's um, I go around the country and I have been for the last 12 years just sharing this experience of this presence and um, there's not really talks or set sermons or anything of the like. It's more just we come together with the joy of, of the Spirit and let the Spirit orchestrate the, the gathering because everyone has the answer. And it's just been layers of concepts and beliefs of, of dualism, of past thoughts and projections in the future that just try to distract away it distract the mind away from the present moment, so I'm just feeling very grateful that we can come together in this precious time and just share insights and share uh, the experience of the now and anything that seems to be a deterrent or something that covers it over, we can expose that and just see that for what it is. So I teach that enlightenment is just the state of mind that's here and now, that there really are no problems and that if there are problems that seem to be coming up in your thought about, you know, anything involving health, body, finances, um, relationships, and so on and so forth, that this opportunity is a chance to see the falsity of those thoughts, the, the falsity of anything that would try to detract you and take you away from the present moment experience. So I live a life of joy where I go around with these gatherings and literally say, there are no problems. There are no real problems. And anything that seems to be a problem that, are, that is arising is just really an opportunity to bring your mind back to the now. Come back to the present moment and experience the I am presence that, that is real, that is true. And experience the joy of that where you can flow along and feel in the flow with, with the Did divine. You say the I am? The I am presence, yes. That's the great I am that I am. Yes. Yeah. It's the oh, it, that's a good word. It's not a him or her, because its spirit doesn't have any gender, and right. so uh, it's really it's the point of of. Awareness, the high end presence that transcends the dualistic concepts of this world, including male, female, or masculine, feminine. You know, there's all the different traits that seem to involve dualistic opposites. Pairs of opposites are part of the defense or the distraction against the high end presence in the here and now, including past and future. <laughs> Another pair. You could go on and on and on. <coughs> so, really, what. Um, what enlightenment is, is really when you've emptied your mind of all the concepts, right, wrong, good, bad, you know, all the dualistic concepts, what you're left with is what is, what is, what is forever true. It's very much like uh, Zen Buddhism where they talk about just emptying the mind, empty your mind of everything you think, you think you think, you think you know, and come into a state of, of clarity, of happiness, of joy. So I feel like my experience of it is just it's the greatest job in the world because there's no one to convince. You you can go around and just shine your light. There's no there's no debates, there's no issues, there's nothing to confront in the sense that I have no one to confront. Um, I have there's no organization to it, so it can't be made political because you can't organize the present moment. There's nothing there to organize. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a state of joy, a state of being, and um, what you do is when you go when you surrender into it, you really realize that that's where the peace comes in. That you aren't trying to cling to something that's make believe, because that's where defenses seem to come in when there has to be 
defenses or protectiveness or whatever, you're getting into protecting illusions. But the spirit doesn't need protection. And who you are is spirit. So that's really what enlightenment is about, is starting to see that you identify with the spirit and you disidentify from the, the time-space concepts, including the body, which is just a temporal device that can be used along the way. But in the end, you... You know, you cross a river, you don't have to carry the boat with you after you've crossed the river. You know, you you are the very point, you are the very destination of the whole journey. So, when we come together like this, this is a real precious time to, uh, as I was saying earlier today, in an earlier gathering, to just, just be still and enjoy the silence and enjoy the peace. And then if anything seems to come up, any questions or curiosities start to burble up into consciousness, let them come, you know? That's that's how we can go into the, the now in a very respectful, reverent, friendly way, is just to see if there's anything that comes up, um, questions, concerns, issues, that seem like a distraction in your mind, distracting you away from the stillness and the peace, then this gathering we have here could be a, a gathering of illumination a gathering of seeing the simplicity of the present moment, and that to live in the present, you don't really have to give up anything. There's nothing real to be given up. It's just being convinced that that the present moment is real, and that everything that involves the past and the future has been a distraction from the present moment. I used to be in psychology, and you know we would learn about defense mechanisms, <coughs> Denial, repression, projection, you know, sublimation, all these different things. And it dawned on me at one point that that the past and the future were defenses as well. That when the mind gets off into being concerned about its past regrets and rehashing the past, trying to go over it and over it, or it projects out a future with worries and fears and concerns, it's just guarding against the acceptance of the present moment. So, in a real practical way, that's what this is about, is about letting go of thoughts of past and future. And I'd be happy to share any experiences I've had in my life and experiences that I've had in coming coming to that experience. Uh, that's what I was doing earlier today, I was sharing a lot of experiences and how I seem to be guided moment by moment and how to, to lay down the charade of, you know, planning for the future and rehashing the past. Could you Tell us about your riverboat experience. I'd like to that again. The riverboat <coughs> experience. Which one? Oh, was that? The one that you're laying down. I know. Yeah. You know. She went to the uh, Bible teaching class in <coughs> 10 minutes, and then you went to this boat. Yes, that was um, oh. back around 1991. I was. Uh, I was just impelled to travel. I felt so much joy, almost like an explosion of joy, and I was impelled to start traveling without anything that, that, the, that the ego mind would have considered important, without money or um, financial support in terms of uh, organizational support or you know something to help, help me in my travels. I just was guided to take off. And this, the night you're describing was the second night out. The first night out, I was at a church, and uh, somebody gave me the Urantia book. Some of you might have heard of that. It's a big, big spiritual book. But the second night out, I was I was driving on uh, I-44 down uh, towards um, Oklahoma, and I, I crossed in or came in in the morning time into uh, Tulsa, and I. I had a list with me of different Course of Miracles groups, and I knew that there was one at this church. It was a Sunday morning, so I went, but it was the last five minutes of the Course of Miracles group, and I, so I just let go of the, the thoughts, any kind of thoughts of judgments about walking in, maybe like hopping in on a Power of Now group or something on the last five minutes of, of the group in a city that you've never been to. Um, I just popped in. They were having a big discussion on sexuality and and all the implications and how, how do you apply spirituality with sexuality and all this stuff. And so um, I just listened to the conversation and then introduced myself and they were kind of embarrassed about, you know, we don't always talk about this at this group every week. <laughs> 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 really, they said, really, we, we really don't and everything. And I said, oh, I, 
fine, fine. And then this gentleman invited me out to lunch. And then I went out to lunch with a group of people from the group. Then I was invited to his apartment. And he said, um, can we have a, uh, a gathering? Can we explore these topics and go deeper into the discussion? Uh, I have a houseboat, and why don't we have a potluck? And he started calling all kinds of people. And that evening, we, just the second night out, we had a, a discussion on the top of his houseboat as we cruised out on this lake and we were, oh, had a potluck and had watermelon and we're spitting the seeds out on the side and I was just like looking up at the sky with all the stars twinkling and the, the moon and glimmering off the lake in this warm in lake at Tulsa on a Sunday evening and we were just having this deep discussion and it was just so orchestrated, it was so spontaneous. There was I had never been into Tulsa. I had never been to that church, I had never met any of these people, and we, there we were, under the, the moonlight, just going into this stuff real deep and feeling the presence of God, and spitting the watermelon seeds over the side, and just like I'd known him forever, and when we finally did pull into port, um, the gentleman said, well, I have to go to work tomorrow, and all of us have to go to work tomorrow, but you're welcome to stay on the, the houseboat for as long as you like. And... Uh, I, that was just like an experience of like, is this what it's like to serve God? I mean, is this the way that it's going to be? And God was saying, yeah, this is it. If you'll, if you'll shine the joy, if you'll just be a witness for love, I'll take care of everything in ways that you can't even imagine. And that was quite a dramatic uh, second night out on the road experience because it just showed that I was just willing to show up and I didn't plan on doing anything, didn't plan on doing a, a seminar or having a discussion or anything, and it just unfolded so effortlessly. And that first trip lasted for about five and a half weeks. It was just traveling around, much like, uh, you know, Buddha would go around with his begging bowl. I didn't even have a begging bowl. Um, I was just out gallivanting around, um, like the apostles, you know, Jesus and the apostles really were on the move a lot. They didn't really, like, have a base. And that was the first trip out in 1991, and it continued that way. I mean, that was just the first of many trips that sometimes would last six weeks, sometimes three, four weeks. And so it was just one flowing movement, one thing leading to the next. And over the years, there have also been uh, hermitage experiences, times going to the woods alone and just, you know, facing the thoughts that would come up of fear or loneliness or, you know, all of the emotions that seem to be part of time. What preceded that first, what was your path? Can you share that with us, how you came to this process of, of living in the now? What, yeah. Where did you come from? Yeah, I, um, I began, I think, just to earnestly seek for some kind of um, awakening or peace, probably back when I was in college. And I was in college for 10 years, so I, I got a couple degrees, and I was kind of the renaissance <laughs> man that goes around and dabbled, you know, I touched on all aspects of the university. So there really wasn't any aspect of the whole University of Cincinnati that I didn't go into, from art history, conservatory of music, to uh, calculus, chemistry, social sciences, anthropology, you know. Hit them all. I was in urban planning for five years, so it was very eclectic, and it was interdisciplinary, so they let me explore around the university. So I, But I spent a lot of time in the library in psychology, philosophy, and religion, um, looking at the deeper nature thing, or the deeper ontological questions of what is existence and what is reality. And also I could see, as I shared this morning, that... Um, from, from studying all the disciplines and talking to the professors that I could see that, that none of the disciplines had any agreement, that they had different world views and different views of reality. So it helped me start to see that there had to be something, an absolute truth that was beyond the opinions and the theories, that was an actual experience. And that the conflict that I was perceiving when I was in college was really the conflict of my own mind. That's what the Spirit told me, that it's not a problem between the disciplines or anything. It's just you're seeing a distorted world because you're, you're not in the present moment and you're not clear. So you're seeing distortion in different angles. So what, that got me started thinking, well, there must be an absolute truth, an experience, and I must find this, that this is the only point of life or living. 
that, um, and I'm sure all of us have come to that at some point, in some way, where it launches you into reading metaphysical books and um, traveling around to meet with um, teachers and gurus. And um, I'd say for me, too, it, it did that, but as well, it, it, asked, it got me questioning my own unconscious belief system. Because when I was in anthropology and, and looking at some of these different, um, uh, like there were cultural social scripts, and I said, what is the script that I'm playing? And I didn't particularly like the idea of, of playing out a script that I was, wasn't even aware of what was underneath there that was dictating the script. So that got me into, well, let me find the roots. I, I don't like the idea that I'm like a puppet acting out a script based on unconscious beliefs and that I don't have a choice in my state of mind that, that I, it's unconscious. So the latter part of those ten years of college were, was in psychology and some philosophy. And um, then after that I realized that my whole academic career was part of a, a wheel, like I was on a wheel of academia, that that wasn't it either, that I was never going to find the answer, you know, by learning, that I really had to unlearn or peel the onion and get down to the bottom of consciousness. And then um, I had an experience where I stepped off the wheel and just said, okay, what's next? And then A Course in Miracles came into my life at that point which was really just a reflection of my desire, because it said to learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Did someone bring it to you, like, personally? I was out in California um, at a humanistic psychology convention, and uh, some of you may have heard Carl Rogers, yes. um, mm -hmm. Virginia Satir. Mm -hmm. I, I found it... Humanistic psychology was resonating with me more than any other aspects of psychology. And then as I went out and got deeper into it, I found that transpersonal psychology was resonating more than anything. Um, and I saw Carl Rogers right before he seemed to die, and uh, everyone just stood up, and they had so much love for this man that they, the whole auditorium just stood up and just roared and applauded and applauded because of all this love that they had experienced through this man, and I was so touched to be there, and then that was probably the last public experience, appearance that Carl had. <coughs> and um, But while I was there, that's how I was introduced to the Course, was I, I went down where everybody was selling their, um, their books and their tapes, and there was two students of A Course in Miracles teacher, Tara Singh, that were down there, and so I came across the book, and when I, I, I watched the videotape, and I felt like, things were being spoken about that I hadn't even verbalized yet, that, that I was aware were in me. And then when I picked open the book, I just felt waves of love kind of just gushing over me. Like I, I was grateful for the nuggets of truth that I had found so many places, but this was like hitting a, a vein of gold or something. It's like, wow, how, this is, so, it was just waves of love. And kind of an experience of like, Take, having your breath taken away. Who wrote this book? Kind of feeling, and that I knew <coughs> at point my life would never be the same. And I, I was guided to go up to uh, where Tara Singh had his center. And I, when I walked into the the little house that they have up there, it felt like that show um, on TV, This Is Your Life, <laughs> where you know they have all these memories from the past. This is the one in Los Angeles. Yes, in Los Angeles, formerly on the South Burnside. He'll be there. Pictures of Mother Teresa, Ramana Maharshi, sayings on the walls, people coming up and hugging you and smiling. It just seemed like it was in slow motion. Like I was just, it was that TV show, This Is Your Life. And now here's Mother Teresa to say, here's Ramana Maharshi. And all these people coming up and hugging me. And I just thought, yeah, this is, this is my life. This is, I, I, people talk about deja vu and recognition. I just felt like this my life will never be the same. It was just so intense. It, like Everything slowed down. So that's what started it. That was the initial thing. And then after that, I came to go at it with such passion that I was telling um, Ar Arvind that I would read it for probably eight hours a day until the resistance would come until my eyes would, <laughs> would come down and get heavy. And then I would, you know, take a walk or smile. And, 
The first thing you brought up was I am presence. Uh, have you studied uh, Elizabeth Kelly Prophet, Mark Prophet, and all that? Along the way, yeah, it's amazing. I, I read things. all those books yeah. uh, a long time ago. I was wondering, that was one of the first things you said. Yeah, that was one of the early symbols. That was along the way where the I am presence. And, and yeah, I never hear anybody talk about that, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it was a good stepping stone idea and good good reflection. And um, it got, the deeper I got into it, the more I started to realize that it was it was really a walk of trust and faith. Because to hang with this and to really let go of the past and the future, it just takes a lot of faith and trust, because all the conditioning is lined up to say, you know, you have to do certain things to survive, and you have to believe certain things and think certain things, and the deeper I got into it, the more I saw that it was just a bunch of assumptions, that that this whole world was just based on assumptions, like layers of assumptions. Sensationalism. <laughs> yeah. Right, that, and coming to producing the five senses, and I, I would tell people that ego is in cahoots with the five senses, because the five senses just seem to witness to duality and fragmentation and multiplicity, and the experience that we've all had tastes of, that glimmer of the oneness, just is completely beyond that sense of looking through the five senses, it literally transcends that. And so that was my experience with, with it, was I just said, I really have to learn to trust my intuition and to really listen within, because what my five senses are showing me are, is not reliable. You know, they're showing me differences and fragmentation. And by the time you got around to the Course in Miracles, you had already read there and um, Prophet. So, did you see a relationship, I mean, in terms of this writing style or in terms of the message? I mean, it's almost like they were the same, the same message, the same, not only the same message, but almost delivered by the same messenger. Did you feel that? I felt like, not, not only with that book, but with a lot of books, um, even in humanistic and transpersonal psychology, I would find my heart just, I had like a little tickle in my heart chamber. And it wasn't intellectual. I could tell that I would pick up certain books in the library. I would just kind of play games. I would be running up and down the aisles and just grab any old book and pick, just pop it open and go, wow. And I would feel the little, little tickle. And then I would run to another aisle and just reach over to any book, not even look at the titles, and pop it open and go, ah. Because it was kind of a, I had been trained in kind of the linear way. You know, you read books from beginning to end and and very analytical and all this and that. And so this spontaneous sense of just popping books open and feeling the tickle was, I just said, I'll let the tickle lead because it is joy. And I want to let joy lead. So that's how I found a lot of those books, was I would just be in used bookstores or libraries or whatever and just start popping them open. And, of course, there's no accidents. You can't, you know, it can't have a coincidence or a an accident by grabbing a book and popping it open. It just well, gives you what you need. But I just heard that you just saying that we're, this, the world is so into structure. It's structured. The beginning, the end, and this is, you build on, build on, build on, build on. And actually, the now has no structure. Right. Is that right? That's it. The now has no structure whatsoever. And that's and it takes. And there's space. no right and wrong way in the now. Right. There's no right and wrong way. There's, it's just a, a moment of acceptance. What you start to see is in the now moment, you you include everything in. In other words, uh, perception through the ego's lens involves rejection. You know what is what likes and dislikes. What's acceptable and what's unacceptable is the way that the the ego operates. And the ego is always in the past or the future. It's never just now. This now moment is, is the point of stillness in which there is no ego. It's just pure I am presence. So it took a lot of faith, you know, as I would go deeper and deeper into it, was just um, noticing that, that all concepts of, of dualism and judgments that involve the past and the future didn't bring me any peace. And I had, it took like leaps of faith to just follow the prompts about what I was to say, where I was to go, what I was to do. 
and fe- and just feel the joy that came from listening and following to that little small voice that was in there guiding. And the tickle. Initially, in the early years, it wasn't so much even a voice. At that point, it was just like the tickle. I would follow the tickle because that was authentic and it was joyful and gleeful. So I said, "This is this is not an intellect, or this is not a." Uh, an analytical mind trying to figure it out. It's just this pure, like almost like childlike sense of wonder and joy. Yeah, question. Um, this warm tickle was kind of like a good spirit, uh, angelic spirit. Are there what makes people do bad things? Is there evil spirits running around the world, or do we? Is that part of the structure or what? Yeah, evil, evil and error are really synonyms. So you might just say that the spirit is um, just pure love, pure goodness, and that you could say that um, ego and error are synonymous. So evil is just, you might say, ignorance or error, or just ego is another way of putting it. And the ego doesn't have any reality except that if a mind believes in it, gives faith in it, it seems to give reality to that which has no reality. So that's that's where illusion arises, by trying to give some faith and power and strength to something that has no <coughs> existence, that has no um, meaning. The ego is, um, you know, analogous to error in the sense that it's just this idea that it's a belief that you could separate from your source, is really what what the ego is. And that's what the evil is, the beliefs that you can separate from your source. But the source is spirit, so that's why the, the, it's no, there are no evil spirits, <laughs> because that would be a contradiction in terms. Mm-hmm. But that error can seem to take on a life of its own, and can seem to involve destruction and pain and guilt and fear and all these things, when, when you give a powerful mind to something that is that is crazy. You marry something powerful with something that's insane, then that's what seems to be uh, the, the, the cosmos of in which there's duality, multiplicity, and you know, uh, destruction and so forth. I have a question. It's you say it seems to be our physical reality is that we are hurting each other as a people, as people on the planet. What reality is that? Well, what I came to understand was that that reality was eternal and changeless, pure love, pure innocence, and that what seemed to be physical reality was uh, was a projection of the error, was a projection of the belief that you could separate from your source. So. The world is kind of like a, you know, in the Bible they talked about Adam and Eve and they talked about, uh, you know, feeling ashamed and covering themselves with a fig leaf. The cosmos of time and space is like a cosmic fig leaf for the mind that thinks that it could separate from its source. So you might think of it as a giant distractive device and a giant cover to try to cover over something that is um, believed to be very horrible. The belief that you could split your mind apart from your creator and rip it apart is what the cosmos was made to cover. But spirituality comes along and says, um, that small still voice says, come down with me into your mind. It may seem like there's a lot of dark caverns down there and everything, but if you come down with me and we go to the core, you'll recognize that that the error that seemed to make this cosmos has been corrected, and that the, beneath the error is the light and love of creation, is reality. So the journey seems to be a journey of faith. When the temptation comes to say, I'm going to look out in the world and I see people killing each other, I see nations going against each other, and I see people shooting and killing, and, and there's, it's, a, it's a world of violence, of, of scarcity, of conflict, you know, in any direction. It takes the faith to start to say, okay, maybe I'm not perceiving the world correctly. Maybe I have a distorted perception of things. That's what I did. I had to come to the first of the realization that 
that even though I was seeing, perceiving that in the world, that I wasn't seeing the world clearly. I was seeing the world through a lens of uh, a lens of judgment, and that was what was producing the distortion. And that I had to have faith and trust to let go of that judgment, and let the world be shown to me anew by the Spirit. So that's what I did. <laughs>